The session is in order. Welcome to the Public Square from the American Policy Roundtable. And Wayne Shepard here with the team, which consists as Dave Zanotti, Rob Walgate, Melanie Elsie, Jeff Sanders, and our producer, Alan C. Duncan. Okay, there's an election everybody knows about. We all know what's ahead, don't we? The uh, election of the President of the United States. But there's an election that no one sees we want to talk about today, Dave. Wayne, the, uh, the spirit and the attitude around here is, is one of intense intense activity and a certain sense of excitement Mm -hmm. because we recognize that America is now in the process of voting and making decisions. And this is one of the places where every two years and every four years, the work of the American policy Roundtable, of I voters of the public square of evergreen leadership fund. This is where we all get to watch all the pieces and parts hit the road and start moving. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly exciting. Uh, and and the a number of people that that are now looking for answers to questions is at the highest rate it's going to be, and it's going to only accelerate um, in the next several weeks. And so we are thrilled to be in the midst of all of this activity, hoping to bring more light into people's understandings about what's really going on. It's very exhilarating, and and so for everyone that's praying for us and the people that have supported us over the last four years to help us get once again into this position, because. American public policy has cycles to it. And this is like the high speed cycle right now. Yeah. The whole team is in high gear, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. And and it's exciting to be around. It's exhausting, but it's also exciting. But in the midst of all that, there there's a, a scenario I'd like to uh, to get in, and that would be of a split reality. You've got a whole nation focused on the presidential campaigns and all of the back and forth and the nitpicking and the and the, and the accusations and all the stuff that now attends a high-tech digital era uh, presidential campaign. And it, it's, it's I, we, we grew tired of this a long time ago. The yuck factor is way, way, way over pegging the meter. But what most people don't see is there's an election going on right now that no one sees. And as we've been working through all of the, the work that we've been doing for the last year to put together Abortion in America, our new fact book on abortion, which is now available and everyone can gain access to it. It is not for sale. It is free. Now, it costs a lot over a year's worth of effort just to produce the research on this. And it's expensive to produce and to get out. But the fact is, is that we are not attempting to make money off of this issue or to monetize this election or any of our activities. Everything we have, you're welcome to. And our hope and prayers that we get done today this information is is so helpful that you won't be able to resist getting the links and sending them to everybody and sending this broadcast to everyone so that you can start a conversation that is so valuable because it would be crazy to have this gold mine this treasury of information and for not for people not to find out about it that would be a tragedy so we do have an agenda on today's broadcast and that's by the time we get done We hope you will take this broadcast link and you will send it to everybody you know and get your own copy, your own, you don't don't have to get a copy. It's right there online of abortion in America. Uh, and, and, And so we'll give you the details on how to get that in just a minute. Okay, so the election no one sees. Here's the key. It's about ballot issues. There are 10 states that have ballot issues specifically on abortion. And if those 10 states are, are, um, if, if the abortion, the progressive abortion industry and the movement, and I link those two, the progressive and the abortion, the progressive political movement in America, which is the radical left, George Soros, John Podesta, the international billionaires, and all of, all of the most radical elements of the left that we've come to experience over the last 20 years. And they've been around longer than that, but people now know the names. You put together that whole coalition, the driving coalition, of progressivism has merged with the abortion industry. And in 10 states, they are conducting an election on ballot issues with designs that go way past a constitutional amendment on abortion. All of it is a strategy to net tremendous wins in this coming election. Dave, I have a simple, honest question. Why is abortion such a paramount issue for this group? Uh, it's a paramount issue for this group, not because they are so infatuated with abortion. 
That's one element. Uh, the abortion industry, Planned Parenthood, which survives and thrives off of state and federal grants and funds, uh, a significant in, a network of billionaire donors and a huge network of other supporters around the country. They're an industry, uh, Wayne. They are, an, mm-hmm. they, are an, an, um, they are a very dynamic industry. And over the last 50 years of Roe versus Wade, this is big. They're the true zealots of abortion. All the other people see abortion as a means to an end. Okay. When we get done going through this chart today, you'll see exactly what we're talking about, how they're using abortion as a wedge issue to particularly reach out to certain voting groups and get them to the polls. So the reason they're doing these 10 ballot issues is to win at multiple levels in this election. Abortion just happens to be the tool they're using this time. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk first off a word about constitutional amendments. Every one of these measures is a constitutional amendment in 10 different states. And so what's happening is you have a situation where the abortion industry is attempting to write their business plan and their objectives into state constitutional law. And let's set up this whole idea of how law works in America. You have the United States Constitution. That is the highest law in the land. Ultimately, if something is inconsistent with the United States Constitution, and someone's willing to press the issue to the nth degree, somehow, some way, everything has to align with the U.S. Constitution. After that, you have uh, federal law, U.S. Code. Now, that, of course, is something that we can argue about a lot. That's what Congress is supposed to make. Nobody else. But we Keyword can, being yeah, supposed. We can, we, we can argue about that. When you get to the state level, the state constitution now is the paramount law of the land, but the state constitution must conform to the federal constitution. And then all of the laws in your specific state have to conform to your state constitution and to the U.S. constitution. That's why the U.S. constitution is a very small document. Because it's mostly about the construction and operation of the federal government. The Bill of Rights gets a little bit more expansive, and then the amendments expand a little bit more. But when you get to your state constitution, those are big documents. The reason those are big documents by comparison is because they have to set up how your state's going to operate. And then you get into a lot of stuff like education policy, which is there's got to be details. You don't have an education, a clause section in the United States Constitution because they're not supposed to do public education. One additional thought beyond that, Dave, is that, um, yes, the the state constitutions have to conform to the federal constitution, but they also can't conflict. Right. right. So, it, and you, and you're right. It brings in other uh, concepts. I would even say other industries such as the education industry and all the related products, the healthcare industry and all those related products. So let's talk about that because here's the challenge. You have state constitutions where you have to set up the rules on how your state's going to conduct itself. And sometimes you have to put constitutional language in there to set the boundaries on how the state is going to work with specific issues and then into certain industries. For example, the state doesn't own every hospital, but the state, in, it, it touches at almost every level of healthcare. Right. So you, the, this is where lawmakers really do make their money and where you really do want to send people that know what they're talking about into the legislative process that are willing to learn it. It's not that it can't be learned. It is honestly intriguing stuff. It's like putting puzzles together. But you have to learn how the pieces fit. And you have to do it in a constitutional construct. Now, when industries come in with specific designs and create amendments where they're putting their business plan, their objectives into your state constitution, you got to watch yourself. And they're adding language to it that says the legislature has no authority over this section. So So they're taking away the representation of the people through their state legislative bodies. Three primary examples where this is going on around the country right now is the marijuana industry, the gambling industry, and the abortion industry. These are three industries that are attacking state constitutions. They're not going into statutory law where you make laws in the books with, through the legislature to say, here's how the marijuana business is going to operate in the state of whatever. They want constitutional provisions. Casino gambling. And sports wagering, same way. They want constitutional. Their attempt, this is new. This is not something that's been done before. Now the abortion industry is following suit. Post Roe and post Dobbs, they now want to put and enshrine abortion in the Constitution. The myth is we're enshrining abortion because uh, because a right has been taken away from women and we're putting that right back into 
the Constitution. We can't put it in the federal Constitution, so we'll put it in the state Constitution. That's the mythology. And it is mythology. Mm -hmm. Because the right to abortion does not exist anywhere in American law or jurisprudence. You won't find that. You'll find the right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. You'll, you'll find all kinds of different, but you won't find the right to abortion. That's why the Supreme Court couldn't make Roe stick because it's not there. Now, what you will find is the right to life that extends to an expectant mother to protect herself and her life if is need be because of the, of the pregnancy. That can happen. You will find that. And you'll find an ongoing debate in this country that's been going on from the beginning and is not yet resolved about how do we determine the right to life of the unborn child. And people divide on that dramatically. But you will not find the words right to abortion. It's, so let's make it up then. Well, that's it. That's the point. Let's make it up the and draw said, the lines as broadly as we possibly can. Let's make it up out of privacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was one part. Reproductive right. freedom. Now what they're saying is that the right really is the right of autonomy, that there is a right of bodily autonomy. Well, okay, where's that in the Constitution? Where's that in the Northwest Ordinance? Where's, where's that in the Bill of Rights? So they're inventing words now to try to make you believe that something was taken away from all of us and that now they're restoring it. Even though when the Dobbs decision took place, even the most restrictive states in the union still allowed for some abortion. It wasn't like all abortion was obliterated. So what we've got, Wayne, is this conflict. Uh, we, there's, there's a game being played. It's a bait and switch. Let me jump in here because we need to take a break. And obviously, this requires much more discussion. We'll get after it as you stay with us now on The Public Square. of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. We mentioned there are 10 states where this constitutional amendment is on the ballot this year, the election no one sees. Even if we're not living in one of those 10 states, this is a vital issue, isn't it? Well, it's a vital issue because it's going to impact every one of us, Wayne. Because what's actually, and, and we'll, we'll start the conversation, is in these 10 ballot issues, it's not just the ballot issues that the abortion industry is after. They're after control of the United States Senate. They're after winning the presidential election. They're after a whole number of different pieces and parts that they intend to use the wedge issue of abortion hmm. to, br to drive voter turnout and to win electoral college votes, to win Senate seats, to win control of the Senate. So this is step one. Yes, step one. And in my travels to different states where I've seen highly contested United States Senate race, it's amazing the commercials that are being aired that talk about the issue of abortion. And I'm left scratching my head and always in the room I'm with with folks. I'm like, it's interesting they talk about that because whoever is elected to the United States Senate is not going to have a vote on any legislation that deals with the federal issue of abortion. But they make it seem that way. Does everybody get that? That's a huge yeah. point. That is a huge point. This is all a bait and switch. So let's go back to constitutional amendments for just a second. When any industry is trying to write their agenda into state constitutional law, watch out. That's really troublesome. Well, we saw that one state, you, you referenced casino gambling earlier. In 2009, Dan Gilbert and his friends legally bought a piece of the Ohio Constitution yeah. by writing their business plan of four brick and mortar casinos into the state constitution. It was bad public policy. It was bad it was a terrible idea then. And, and they then, always seize upon a panic because in 2009, the economy was bad. And people I, I talked to left and right were saying, well, but it's for the jobs. I, even though I hate gambling, I'll vote for the jobs. There's always a bait and switch. So in each of these 10 amendments, there is a bait and switch. And, and, and that's important to know. 
So we've got to watch the words that go into the constitutions. That's really important. You've got to watch it when special interests and industries are attempting to write their business plan. It doesn't matter what they are. So that's, that's the context. And we also have to watch how clever lawyers for a specific industry can use words that sound like one thing, but in fact are doing something quite the opposite. So what are the 10 states? Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Maryland, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, New York, Nevada, and South Dakota. Now, what, what, this is a very, that's really varied, isn't it? You think, well, yeah, it is. That's what struck me as you read that list. Yeah. So well, only well, one in the South. Okay. So Florida, what, 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 uh, maybe, maybe Missouri. So that's let's a, go over and we're going to take some time here and break down each one of these amendments. And this is not going to be boring. This is going to be really like putting together a fascinating puzzle picture. Let's start and look at what is the agenda behind. So Arizona, Arizona has a measure that will establish the fundamental right to abortion that the state of Arizona may not interfere with before the point of fetal viability. In every one of these measures, you're going to have a conversation about fetal viability. How is the abortion industry playing bait and switch on that? Who defines what, what fetal viability is? It's, it's a fluid term. That's why. It, it's a fluid term, but it also goes on to say, after fetal viability, abortions are allowed when necessary to protect the life or health of the pregnant individual. Prohibits laws penalizing per a person for assisting an individual obtaining an abortion. I notice it says individual and not woman. Well, well and it says person and not doctor. Yeah. You will yeah. not it find says, the word woman, woman in any of these measures. Yeah, and what about health? Was it, that mental health too? It, yeah, the word health is not defined. Okay, so here's, now we're, we're, we're jumping ahead. Now, there's certain, um, what we, what lawyers would call weasel words. <laughs> okay, words that just are not transparent and they could mean one thing or they could mean another. Mm -hmm. So the first question we brought up is, who decides what is viability? How do you define viability? In all of these measures, what you will find is they do not require that an OBGYN or a licensed practicing physician is required. The terms are like words like medical professional. So like an EMT? Or, attending, or a medical practitioner. Attending medical practitioner. A uh, chiropractor it, then? It, that's, it, Jeff, it could be anyone. Well, in broadly speaking, fetal viability means the ability of the child to survive outside the womb. Right. But but what they're not defining is what's the actual date? You know, how old is that? 23, the, 24 weeks? A lot the of people gestational say, age. Yes, they're not defining the gestational age. Correct. And my guess would be with the medical technology increasing, that age should get lower and lower. There are children lower, already at but, four and a half months. But hang on, out of the hang womb. on. You all, that's good. See, now see, Wayne, how they were leaning into logic, <laughs> leaning into science. <laughs> we try. And leaning into precedence. What is but wrong wait, with you people? <laughs> but wait, there in these measures, there's also a provision that basically says in the, in the, in the good, there's even one amendment says in the good faith judgment of this medical practitioner, Whoever that might be, whoever's got a lab coat or wearing a mask. School nurse. What, it, it, hmm. Jeff, I'm telling you, I know that seems a little sarcastic. No, I can, no, 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 I'm not being but, sarcastic. No, I'm being it, serious. It could be. A school okay. nurse okay. could say this to a 15-year-old. It could be. Or the and, abortionist who's making money off the procedure. Oh, there you go. I, I didn't think it of could that. be the abortionist. There is this provision is that when it comes to fetal viability, if that person making the decision is aware that the ability to move this situation from an abortion to a viable childbirth, if there are extending medical conditions that make that too difficult, they can say it doesn't matter. In other words, they're basically saying viability is dependent upon whether or not it's going to require uh, extra services, extra care. That This is literally walked out in this language. Now, what kind of a person doesn't understand that any premature birth, because viability is not full term, that any premature birth wouldn't require additional medical services? So if a person's in a clinic that doesn't have those services and the determination is we don't have the stuff to be able to move from here, so this is in essence a non-viable child. Can I, can I they use... Back, do you understand what I'm saying? They backdoor yeah. this mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Can I use some more logic? Sure. Okay. So think about the, the incredible power we're giving these new high priests of the medical field, however you want to define that. So what's going to stop them or somebody with an, of another ballot initiative that if someone is a quadriplegic, 
you know what? Mm-hmm. We're just putting too much money into this. And it's just not worth this person's life. Their it's, quality of health too, is so bad. Too big a stretch. And and, and well, I, not yet. I mean, no, at some point, it's too big a stretch. All right, but but I'm going to be seventy before long. But <laughs> <laughs> the precedent for what you're saying uh-huh. is established in this approach. Yeah, the groundwork is so, there. The groundwork is the there. Philosophical See? groundwork for people to start Thank excusing you. and giving me a death yeah. pill when I'm okay. 75. So it's conceivable that a lawyer or an amicus brief somewhere down the road in some decision would point to that and say, if we can say it here, can we not logically extend it to here? So your point is well taken, Jeff. It's too far a leap today. Yeah, today. But the point that you're making is that they're planting seeds for tomorrow is a very important point. And this, this reminds me of the Virginia governor at the time, Ralph Northam's quote about, you know, if the child is born, uh, you know, there was, they were attempting an abortion, they were born, but we're going to set it aside and have a discussion about what's going to happen. Yeah, we're going to cheek. Yeah. Yeah. That exactly. quote made the rounds years ago, but it, I think that it bears remembering uh, exactly. during this conversation that they're defining fetal viability in the room. In the room. And the people who are doing it don't even have to be remotely qualified to make that decision. Now, the other thing about this is that there are no defining words that say, what does life mean? What does health mean? What does mental health mean? So that in essence, if you use the magic words, you can proceed. That's all it is. If you use and document the magic words, you can go forward. It's like an insurance situation. Get out of jail free cards. Yes, if you're in an argument with an insurance company and you don't use the magic words, then the person on the other end of the phone isn't going to help you. But if you use the magic words, then the process goes forward. So this is what we're dealing with here. And they're putting magic words that that they understand. So this is, they're doing their business plan and their practices to their advantage. and, And their end goal is always to make abortion the option, to make abortion the choice, to make abortion the decision. So this is how the weasel words, and in every one of these proposals, they are filled with what I'm going to call weasel words. Mm -hmm. Ways out, back doors, trap doors. So it's not just Arizona. No. Let's go to Colorado. Colorado has a right to abortion initiative. Provide a constitutional right to abortion in the state constitution and allow the use of public funds for abortion. Allow? ruh So this is the first time in the country that there would be a... Uh, language that would re- require or allow for the use of tax dollars, my tax dollars if I live in Colorado, um, to be used to pay for abortions. And there's going to be no way to court challenge that in a way that strips it. Wayne, look at that one. Wow. Look, there's, there's, look, here's why 10 states, because they can get away with it in Colorado because yeah. they are, the Colorado has gone so far left that people go, oh yeah, good. Now we're going to pay for them with state dollars. That's more justice. That's more that. Uh, well, wait Compassion. What about all the Christians in Colorado? What about all the evangelical organizations in Colorado? Mm-hmm. What about all the people who, I mean, they can be atheists who, 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 for that matter, and who, who don't believe that this kind of an approach or, or the libertarians who say, wait a minute, not with my tax dollars. Are the Catholics talking about this in what Colorado? What about the Catholics I, in Colorado? I would bet that they are. But if I this now are. becomes a constitutional law, this is in the constitution and you say, I'm not paying for that with my tax dollars. I can't stop you from doing it. They met, but well, wait a second. What are they going to do? <laughs> no recourse. You can't not pay your state Tough. taxes. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, no. maybe, maybe take it to the su- Supreme Court. But then they but could say, "Well, no, that's a state, state constitutional matter. amendment." Yeah, we're not going to touch yeah, that. Well, yeah, exactly. Why would? Thank you, Jeff. That's really but, smart. But, Why but, would the U.S. Supreme Court say we're going to rule on a state tax question and say the state? By constitutional amendment, the approval that we're going to overturn an election and say you can't tax people for that. How are you going to get away with that? We're also talking about one of the two states that before the Dobbs decision had one of the only late term abortion doctors Mm -hmm. practicing in the United States. So look at where we're going here. This is another this and this is not a seed. This is a hammer. They're, yep. they're taking another big piece because if they can make people pay in one state and silence the opposition. How many more states can they do it in? Well, at the top of our discussion today, we mentioned a new research report available, a very comprehensive report, Abortion in America, put together by the American Policy Roundtable. If you would like access to that, you can read the report, as Dave said earlier, free of charge. Go to life.aproundtable.org. Once again, life.aproundtable.org. 
aproundtable.org. And we'll give that again here on The Public Square. Back with the team on the public square today as we talk about abortion in America. We've uh, covered two of the 10 states that have constitutional, yes, constitutional amendments to allow abortion. Dave, uh, what state are we going to next? Let's go to Florida. Florida is to provide a constitutional right to abortion before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. Now, we've already gone through all the weasel, weasel words there that makes it sort of all that, all those except for and viability and everything else. All right, let's make one thing clear about viability. When you go to abortion in America, the report that we've just produced after a year's worth of research, what you're going to discover is that 93% of all abortions happen by the end of the first trimester. So when an amendment is crafted to say, we're going to, uh, we're going to basically prohibit abortion at viability and after viability, we're talking at best, maybe, maybe 4% of all pregnancies that would end up in abortion? Maybe. So let's be clear about these laws. When, and, and in a state like North Carolina, where they passed an amendment that was considered a ban because they banned abortion, I believe it was at 12 weeks, 96% of all the abortions that would happen in, in North Carolina are permitted under that law. So when we're talking about abortion at or past viability, we're talking about a very small percentage. And for those early weeks, it it also not just prohibits, but it, it per, shall no law shall penalize, delay, or restrict. So any law, for example, that would be a 24-hour waiting period, once you get the medical information, wait 24 hours to make your decision on the abortion question, that is would be unconstitutional. And let's talk about one of the raging controversies right now in this country about the uh, uh, tragedies that are happening. And there's, there's not lots of them, but there are being ice, they're being isolated and, and um, uh, promoted. promoted and broadcast regarding the abortion pills. Right. If a state looks at the medical science behind abortion pills and says, wait, 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 this has been expanded way too fast. The Biden-Harris administration went ahead and, and took a position that said these pills should not be restricted. These, these pills, there shouldn't be any, these should get out in the marketplace as wide and as fast as possible. So to put some detail onto that, the FDA approved Ms. Mifeprestone in 2000. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until 2016, 2021, that FDA started relaxing those uh, regulations because they first came out and put restrictions on use and distribution. For example, requiring doctors to prescribe or supervise prescription, requiring patients to have three in-person visits after they took the pill. So in 2021, the FDA announced it would no longer enforce those in-person visits. That had a direct bearing on the life of these women yes, that the, were lost. The stories that we've all heard about the handful of women that have lost their lives because uh, they were not medically supervised through the process and, and things went bad, things went wrong. This is the direct result of administrative decisions from 2021 forward regarding loosening all the restrictions on these pills. These are not magic beans. These pills are dangerous. So the current presidential administration did this. That's right. How about that? Yeah, that's right. So the point is, looking at the Florida piece and other pieces in regards to these constitutional amendments, if someone attempts to restrict access to abortion, they're banned by this, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the amendments say you cannot restrict. In, in other words, anyone that's trying to get involved and engaged legislatively saying, we got a problem with these pills. And if the federal government won't move on it, we're going to move on our state to protect women. That's what we're going to do. Can't do it. 
Can't do it. So they're building a big fence around their industry as well in these constitutional amendments. And Florida is one that's doing it. It's, it's always interesting to me to watch how this happens and how the troops are rallied. And in doing what we did with the report um, at the American Policy Roundtable, the statistics that we've referenced, the facts, the figures, when you look at how eye-opening they are, because I've heard no one discuss this or any of those numbers in any of these amendments. And we've went through these amendments with a fine tooth comb. We've watched commercials. We've seen the promotion of them, but it seems like truth just, just this push to the wayside and everyone relies on emotion because it's all being driven by the agenda of the progressive movement and the abortion industry. Now, Florida is really a profit center issue here. Uh, the, the abortion industry isn't going to turn Florida from red to blue based on this constitutional amendment. Right, that's not going to happen in, in this election. But what they do want to do is to see Florida become the abortion destination for the southeastern United States. So that's big money for Planned Parenthood. And that's why they're doing it. That's why they want Florida. And people will be watching in Florida as well because they need a 60% supermajority to amend their constitution. So the fact that the abortion industry is that confident and willing to spend tens of millions of dollars to promote this and get after it shows um, just they're, they're not going to stop. Maryland, next state. Maryland is, is a, a liberal enough state that whatever the abortion industry wants, they should be able to get. So they're going for a constitutional amendment. It, obviously, they don't need the electoral college votes. Obviously, this is in a Senate race that's involved. So what are they trying to do? Establish a right to reproductive freedom. Oh, there it is. Put that on the chart of key magic words that they want to put into constitutional precedent. It's no longer even the right to abortion. It's the right to reproductive freedom. And by the way, reproductive freedom is not defined. It, it includes, which stipulates that it's not limited to the ability to make effectuate or effectuate decisions to prevent, continue, or end one's pregnancy. That's a weasel word. The word include means it can be other things besides Exactly. This. Thank you. Yeah. So, Maryland. Okay, let's go to Missouri. Missouri. Amend the Missouri Constitution to provide the right for reproductive freedom. Oh, interesting. There's the same words. And provide that the state legislature may enact laws that regulate abortion after fetal, fetal viability. Well, that's good. They're giving the legislature a role to play. How nice. In a very small percentage in, in of a very, the total. In a very tiny capacity. We'll throw you the 4% question. Mm -hmm. We'll keep the 96%. Because that's what they think they need to trick the people of Missouri into doing what they want them to do. Well, and do we know who's writing all of these these amendments? I mean, they're using the same words. It's almost like when you see one side, everybody has the same tweet that goes out. It's like mm -hmm. it's like one person wrote it clearly. Hey, Ellen, I don't remember the name. We asked that very same question a year ago in regards to the Ohio amendment because right. we were seeing this language developing. There is a small legal team I was told about. I honestly can't remember their names now. But it seemed like everything was flowing out of their shop. Um, so there is a group that's allegedly um, being accused, if you will, of being the, the the brain trust of this. But you'll notice it 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 no one talks about. It. No one it's, asks the question you just asked. Yeah. It, well, it's just it's just when you start seeing it, it starts to feel like a plot at some point. You know? yeah, right. yeah. Well, it's nationwide, but but there's nobody in the news saying, "Hey, look at this nationwide movement for the." It's like a web going yeah. out. You, you didn't notice everybody was using the same words. Interesting. Hmm. So who's Mon the source? Uh, Montana. This one is. This one gets really interesting. Amend the Montana Constitution. Provide a state constitutional right to make and carry out decisions about one's own pregnancy, including the right to including the right to abortion. It's like they make an effort to to soft pedal it. Yes. It, you have the right to continue your pregnancy. Did you know that? That's cool. So <laughs> what we've got is a situation in Montana where they're soft pedaling because it's a much more conservative state. But wait, there's more. Montana holds an election for one of the most important Senate races yeah. in the nation. Yeah, John Tester versus uh, Sheehy is the guy's right. last and name. And so this particular measure is designed to, to be just as tolerable as possible to the general public so that the public that they want to get out the most, which would be the pro-abortion community, and in, in large cases, they're going for a female vote 
that they can incite with this measure to change voter turnout. And the goal will be not just to pass this measure. That's the secondary goal is to drive turnout so that John Tester is reelected and the Democrats win that Senate seat and maintain control of the Senate. That's the real agenda in Montana. All right. Well, we need to take a break right here. I mentioned it earlier. I'll mention it again. And I'll add this, that you should share this link with others as you jot it down. Life dot aproundtable.org to get access to this new report on abortion, a very comprehensive research report put together by this team that gives you a lot of the facts we're talking about today and much more. And there's more coming as well. So log on to that, life.aproundtable.org. of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. Back with you on the public square with the team here talking about abortion today and these ballot initiatives, the election no one sees. I mentioned the new research report. Alan, you wanted to add something about that. Well, I think it's important to say we're adding our own commentary to these ballot measures and we're discussing the life book a lot or the the abortion in America booklet with research, there's not commentary from this team in that book. That is a a research document. That is a fact book. You could give that book to someone that you know that is pro-abortion. You can give that to your pastor. It's not going to be filled with the commentary that you're getting now, and it was specifically designed uh, in that way. You know, I was thinking about that this morning, Wayne, because we're going to inevitably have serious debates about the fact book. And one of the things that we intentionally did over the last year of research is to make certain that the only statistics that made it into that book were statistics from the abortion industry or from Mm -hmm. state and local and federal uh, governmental agencies. That was brilliant, by the way. That that was really smart. Yeah, you're not going to find pro-life organizations, their stats in there, which not to say that's bad. But but we're we're, we're using the industry's own numbers. Yeah. Yeah. When you hand it to someone, if they want to have a discussion or a conversation, or even an argument. Say, well, these are the numbers that we Where'd got. Where'd you get that stuff yeah, from? We, we, <laughs> we got them um, from your friends, yeah. is what you would be able to say to those folks. And not do it in a derogatory way, but just to say, hey. It's their numbers. It, it hasn't been the, manipulated. The facts no, speak the defended. Defended. Right. Sure. Yeah. Right. yeah. All right, Melanie, you had a thought, right? Whenever I'm looking at something through a policy lens, you have to look at what language that's there and the language that isn't there. So, for example, on that's why she's the national legislative <laughs> director, by the way, because that happens to be a bit of a gift. <laughs> yeah. When it's talking about in Montana's uh, abortion initiative amendment, one's own pregnancy or health of the pregnant patient, there is no age there. So that means minors can get abortion services without parental consent because mm-hmm. that would be a restriction if you required parental consent. Is parental notification in any of these 10 constitutional ballot issue, issues? Absolutely not. None. None that I can recall reading. We've scanned them all. Um, there might be one that gives an exemption for parental notification, but I'm not sure. Or maybe that one's st- already passed if, before. If that's true, th- I mean, that is that would be extremely. No, but this is the point about restrictions. And, and well, Melanie th- correctly says they don't exempt parental notification or parental uh, pr- permission or consent. No, those are not exempted in, in, in these circumstances. So if you're 14, you can't get a tattoo, but boy, you can get an abortion. And, and this gives uh, a lot of free reign to child predators that mm. somebody could impregnate a child and then get them a secret abortion. Nobody has to be notified. Never you know, thought of that. Yeah, just, just it's a lot of bad things could happen based on this language. So let's go to Nebraska. And Nebraska is an interesting case, Wayne, because you've got competing amendments in Nebraska. Now, Nebraska is a pretty conservative state and a pretty pro-life state. So sure. the abortion industry has an amendment to provide that all persons shall have a fundamental right to abortion until fetal viability. So they're coming up with the traditional language. Now, there is a pro-life amendment that takes a different approach. Then that language says on the ballot, shall the Nebraska Constitution be amended to include a new section which provides 
except when a woman seeks an abortion necessitated by a medical emergency or when the pregnancy results from sexual assault or incest, unborn children shall be protected from abortion in the second and third trimesters. Hmm. So Nebraska has two. Those are on the ballot at the same time? Same time. Those, those, and you hear us in the discussion around the table kind of like not, not tripping over words, but saying, wait a minute, what does this one say? What does that one say? Um, Can so, you imagine the commercials they're getting in Nebraska right now? But wait, um, there's more. Why? Why Nebraska? We talked about bloody Kansas mm -hmm. last week in our broadcast and about when the line was, was drawn. Uh, in by Congress in regards to slavery, then the line was removed. Everything went out to Kansas and Missouri and Nebraska because yep. that's where the, the 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 whole question was in regards to the Missouri Compromise. And, that's and, where people were traveling and the, new, and the country right. was expanding there. So why Nebraska? Now it's the middle of the country. Yeah, but Nebraska is more pro life than not pro life. But there's a bigger agenda, and here's the agenda: the presidential election. Mm. Yeah, they have that weird delegation. The Electoral thing. College. Yeah. Electoral the Electoral College. College. Yeah. The Electoral College in Nebraska is divided so that you have to win the state. And if you win the state, you win. You win all three. the three, but then the, not the two congressional districts, which are created separately. So Nebraska has five Electoral College votes. You win three of those if you win statewide, but two are assigned based upon what, how well your campaign performed in those districts. And so you get the extra two if you win in those specific districts. But here's the catch. The catch is, is the District 2, which is one of those assigned districts, is Warren Buffett's hometown. Warren Buffett happens to be not just the, oh, the, 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 the controlling interest of Dairy Queen. He happens to be the biggest one of the biggest, absolute biggest billionaire funders into the abortion industry in the history of America. Wow. What this is about is flipping that one electoral college vote toward the pro-abortion candidacy for the White House. That's what this is about. So in other words, if it comes down to the presidential race being so close yes. that it's 269 to 269, they're going to pull the winning electoral college vote out of a red state in a blue congressional district where they have a split electoral college strategy. And if the turnout in district two, Warren Buffett's hometown is more pro abort because there's a constitutional amendment on that's how they'll make sure that they win that electoral college vote. That's what this is about. Wow. I, I'm trying to catch my breath there, and I'm trying to follow all the detail of this. Uh, this is why this program exists, isn't it, Dave? The election nobody sees. You got to yeah. get in the other guy's shoes, in the other guy's camp, and figure out what they're doing. Well, in Nebraska, with the five electoral college votes that are available throughout the state, has talked about going to a winner-take-all process like every other state except one. Maine. Maine right. does. Mm -hmm. right. So they've they've talked about that and discussed it, but there's still that blue dot that's around Omaha <laughs> that everyone's right. going to be watching on election night. Well, it, it, it also is concerning, again, based on the life book, that even the, quote, pro-life measure that's on the law or, or that, that's on the ballot isn't even that pro-life. Mm -hmm. Well, hang on a second, though, because the, the language for the Nebraska pro-life uh, that's that's what you're talking about, yes, right? Yeah. Yes. So it will prohibit abortions after the first trimester. It doesn't restrict the legislature from doing anything in the first trimester. Okay. It only okay. prohibits constitutionally from the second trimester on. So it's a step. It's, mm -hmm. So in, a, in essence, you could have a pro-life state legislature that also places um, like parental consent, um, other, other things in, in statutory law that would not be in conflict with this amendment. I see. Okay, so it's better than it appears at first glance. Yes. All right, let me break in here for our final break. If you must leave us at this time, your station cuts away, please, we are online with the rest of this program at thepublicsquare.com.
And we're back with The Public Square, online at thepublicsquare.com. And this report, which we're making known today, Abortion in America, is available at life.ap.org. Alan, you refer to it as the life book. That's kind of our inside term for it, isn't it? But it's very descriptive. Yeah, it was kind of the working title for a little while. It's kind of how we think about it. Okay, but it's called Abortion in America, Research of the American Policy Roundtable. Please follow that link, life.aproundtable.org. Dave? All right, so we got three states to go through. South Dakota, we're going to relatively dismiss, though it does bring back in a trimester framework for regulating abortion in the, abortion in the South Dakota Constitution. That's kind of interesting, but it's, it's, it's a little down the chart right now. But again, another one of those language tricks. Nevada establishes a constitutional right to an abortion, providing for the state to regulate abortion after fetal viability. We've already been through that, except we're medically indicated to protect the life, physical health, or mental health of the pregnant woman. Now, again, when you get into the questions of mental health and it's being decided in the room by a medical practitioner, not a psychiatrist, not a psychologist, there's room. And this brings us back to where we were in Roe in the sense that it it became abortion on demand for any reason because you figured out how to use the magic words. So this is more of the same. Nevada, however, is a highly contested presidential election state as well. And so this, again, is designed to bring out particularly female voters uh, that are this, that, that they've been convinced that something was taken away from them and that, that they're going to make this cause just. So that's the sort of the, the, the rhetoric that's happening in this campaign. We want to close with New York because New York is the penultimate. If you put all of the different pieces and parts, uh, abortion and, 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 and fetal viability and get all the abortion you can for the sake of Planned Parenthood, Then make sure Warren Buffett's got what he wants out of the situation. Then make sure that you go all down the list. Then wait, there's the presidential election. Make sure you got that. Then there's the question of where does this thing end up? Welcome to New York. Now, New York has a procedure where you've got to go through the legislature two times with this amendment before you get it to the ballot. So this is not news. This has been going on for years in New York. And we've been talking about this on the public square for over a year. So we knew this was now coming. it's on the ballot and it's it looks destined, certainly destined to win in New York. And what's it going to do? It is the most heinous abortion language that could be put into a state constitution. Nothing in this section shall invalidate or prevent the adoption of any law, regulation, program, or practice designed to prevent dismantle discriminate based on these new characteristics. So you have no person shall be discriminated against based on ethnicity, national origin, age, disability. They're adding in sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, pregnancy, pregnancy outcomes, reproductive health, and autonomy. They are putting everything, the whole ball of wax, so if, a, if an LGBTQ couple comes to me and says, will you do our wedding ceremony and I refuse it, I'm looking at the language right there. It says that I'm denying them a right, a right to marriage. I can be prosecuted. Am I, am I crazy for thinking that? No, you're not. No, you're not crazy for thinking that. But what if a Christian school says we are not going to hire someone, who a, a, a man who thinks he is a woman? You're going to have... Ex- you're going to have luck. constitutional rights crashing together. But mm-hmm. what about a school teacher in any school who decides they want to teach human anatomy and the biology of reproduction? Huh. And they do it in the, in the, in the construct of science. I, I think they run afoul of this as well. Yes. Yes. Well, they do. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at the official language right now. And it's interesting because the terms his or her are crossed out. Right. And they're replaced with their. And it also, in in general sense, says that no person shall be discriminated against. So that means you're discriminating against me if you don't refer to me by my pronouns. Exactly. There's no definition for discrimination, right? Correct. I mean, discrimination is in the eyes of the beholder. Big so. catch, Alan. Big catch. And you think about the young people that we've had sit around this table and talk to us about different issues. I'm reminded of uh, the TPS shows we did on protecting women's sports and the one thing they talked about with the lgbt community and everything's happening in education is they're never told no they're never told no 
everything they want, they get. Again, they're limiting the legislature on this as well mm-hmm. at the same time in the, in, the, in the language in the second paragraph. What's the penalty? Does it say fines or jail term? Or well, You don't usually find fines and jail terms in a constitutional provision. Okay. But what you have is the broad, you may not do the following. Then the legislature has the ability to create the fines and the terms. Right. In legislation, now that the big change has been made in the constitutional provision, then the judges will be obligated by the statute to enforce what the legislature says. Mm. So here's where we are. This takes us back, Wayne, you'll remember the continuing theme we've had around here for many, many years, is that when we began to see in the Lawrence v. Texas decision by the United States Supreme Court, the Kennedy Doctrine of Personhood, which began to create humanity's definition for the purposes of law and legal rights based upon the practice or the intention uh, of, or the identification of sexual practice. When people became the sum total of what their sexuality was in the eyes of the court and in the dicta or the writings of the court in majority opinions, this started with that seed being planted. And now New York has come to full fruition, basically saying This is a whole class of human beings that you may not discriminate against in any way, shape, or form based upon how they present themselves on these terms. And this is all wrapped up in the the culmination, the union of the progressive movement and all of their affiliates and the abortion industry. Now, it's clear that uh, that New York's electoral votes are not going to be changed. No Senate votes are going to be changed. This is purely planted in the state of New York to create the legal opportunity for the the United States government and the United States Supreme Court to move in this direction. Because when you put something like this in a state as big as New York, it's not going to stay there. So it's the penultimate at this stage in the game on the board. This is the big one. This is the Super Bowl. And they're already guaranteed to win it. That was going to be my question. How many of of these do you think are, are going to pass? Whoa. Boy, that's the, that's a giant question. I don't. The abortion industry usually doesn't lose. They usually don't lose. It's true. I know one thing. When I looked at the, the the situation in Montana last week, there was already an excess of three million dollars coming in from the billionaire class outside of Montana in support of the pro-abortion amendment, and there was twenty-seven thousand dollars on the pro-life coffers. And when I wow. looked at that later, it, it, that was bumped up to eight million. So this is what's happening, friends. This is the election that nobody sees. The pro- progressive and network, Arabella Advisors, Soros and Company, all of these folks plowing tens of millions of dollars into these state initiatives, all for the purposes of altering the outcome of elections, as well as using this as a wedge issue to drive abortion basically off the cliff. Uh, and the cliff right now, the highest point is New York. We've talked before about how the pro-life perspective hedged their bets by putting in trigger laws so that when eventually Roe was overturned, they would have laws in place. So that was the pro-life side going on the offensive. What they did not prepare for was the what if. The counter-offensive. Correct. Exactly. And what they Mm -hmm. did not prepare for is that not only over the last 50 years has the abortion industry become a major player, just as an industry, they are big and they have lots of money and they use a lot of of grant money as well, but they didn't anticipate the rising attendance of the billionaire class of the progressive movement adopting their issues because they could use them for electoral advantage. That's what we're up against. Now, it's possible that the pro-life cause could lose 10 out of 10 of these states. Does that mean it's over? Well, we'll talk more about that. It's not over, but we've got to talk about what happens next. Now, the good news is the charts that we've been working off of today and a full five pages of information has now been amended onto abortion in America. So when you get the fact book, you'll find today's discussion summarized for you as well in the addendum so you can come back and see the notes we worked off of today. All right. Well, today we introduced this new report, Abortion in America, this fact report, this uh, life book, and it is available to anyone who wants to go through it right now online, life.aproundtable.org. Take that, use it, benefit from it, all the information there, and pass it on to others as well. And this program can be heard at thepublicsquare.com. Thanks for listening.
The Public Square is a broadcast service of the American Policy Roundtable.